warp drive is not merely a means of high-speed travel. It is, in fact, a tool of many uses. Some unexpected. This video and others have been brought to you by our forward-thinking patrons, and of course by viewers like you. Thank you. The general concept of the warp drive was first introduced by John W. Campbell in his 1931 novel, Islands of Space. Since then, it has captured the attention of many science fiction writers, such as Star Trek. As with many technologies found within the pages of great novels, a large number of them eventually find their way into reality. And that's because of this little something we call inspiration. Well, Alcubierre was no exception, having been inspired to mathematically work out a model for a potential real-life warp drive during an episode of Star Trek. How awesome is that? Though he never intended to develop it further, he did, however, inspire others, which includes NASA and us. From day one, the drive has been primarily associated with FTL travel. But most of you are probably not aware that the drive has multiple functions. In about 50 years, we will be able to travel FTL. But until then, we can still benefit from the warp drive tech today. And in a moment, I'll tell you how we can do just that. But first, let's provide you with a detailed explanation of the warp drive and how it actually distorts or curves spacetime. The warp drive consists of a collection of the usual high voltage cables, power electronics, coils, cryogenic cooling systems, etc. Common to any high voltage, high frequency system such as particle accelerators and tokamaks. The exact details of the components depends greatly on the specifics of the torus assembly. This is where the real magic takes place, if you will. The entire system functions like this. When energy is applied to the coils, which is approximately 18 billion megawatt hours for one single warp event, a spherical field of normal positive electromagnetic energy is generated around the entire assembly. Now, by spreading this field over a sufficiently large volume, the energy inside the region becomes negative, producing a repulsive anti-gravitational field. That's correct, anti-gravitational field. So, how does it become negative? Well, space-time has a certain baseline energy. This is the so-called zero-point energy. A good demonstration of this is superfluid helium-4, which will never freeze at normal pressures thanks to zero-point energy. Spreading an amount of energy over a sufficiently large volume reduces the energy density inside that volume Eventually, all that is left is the repulsive zero-point energy, which is thought to be behind the mysterious dark energy that causes the universe to expand faster than light. Zero-point energy is actually positive energy, but it expresses itself as a negative pressure, which refers to a repulsive pressure within Einstein's relativity. The negative pressure of the zero-point energy in turn ultimately gives rise to a negative energy. This phenomena was mathematically illustrated by Dr. White of NASA in his papers Warp Field Mechanics 101, 102, and Advanced Propulsion Physics 
harnessing the quantum vacuum. As illustrated on your screen, it's broadly analogous to an adiabatic cooling, where an expanding cloud of gas or aerosol particles cools as a given amount of energy is spread over an increasingly large volume, such as in the box. Eventually, the energy of the cloud becomes negative relative to its surroundings, i.e. cooler than the surrounding gas. As Einstein so famously discovered, mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. That is, E equals mc squared. Mass is merely highly concentrated energy. Therefore, the electromagnetic fields of the warp torus curve space, just as any other field of energy does. This is completely non-controversial and well-known, though usually the curve is extremely small and positive. In this case, the warp torus, the large volume enclosed by the torus field, causes the curvature of the EM fields to be negative, that is, repulsive. The other key piece is another finding by Dr. White. Should a fifth dimension exist, and there is sound evidence that it does indeed, then oscillating energy or mass in whatever form will cause a boost into the fifth dimension. Perhaps in another video we'll explain what the fifth dimension is. The further the energy or mass is boosted, the softer space-time is, the less energy that is needed to curve or distort space-time. So what is negative energy? Negative energy means that a given piece of matter or wave of energy becomes opposite to what we normally expect. When a particle is given energy, it accelerates, and when energy is taken from it, it decelerates. This also applies to massless radiation particles such as photons. But with negative energy particles, the situation is completely reversed. Giving energy to such a particle causes it to decelerate, while taking energy causes it to accelerate, the exact opposite to normal matter. It's a reversal of the usual situation. In 2007, several scientists had recalculated the Casimir effect and found that the energy involved in the Casimir effect is true negative energy, not merely apparently negative. What do you get when you remove all positive energy from a region of space? What you are left with is negative energy. And yet, this is but a doorway into a new world of discoveries. Now, with the warp drive, the problem isn't harnessing large amounts of negative energy. The problem is one of efficiency. Current warp coil designs require far too much energy, as we have already discussed. Thanks to the Gravity Probe B experiment a few years back, we already know that the Earth drags spacetime. The dragging of spacetime is a distortion or curvature of spacetime. Understanding how the Earth curves spacetime is the key to understanding what gravity is. Let me say that again. Understanding how mass, the Earth, curves spacetime is the key to knowing what gravity is. Okay, let's talk more about the specifics of the torus assembly. What you're seeing on your screen is one representation of the torus assembly. This one just happens to contain not one but two independent warp coils. The number of coils and how the coils are configured is very much dependent on their intended function. The coil's configuration is extremely important. One might wish to have a longer field in order to place engines or deflection point defense systems further away. Or perhaps a spherical field is desired to maximize the usable volume. As illustrated, the copper-colored tubing denotes the two warp coils. Within just one of these tubes is the actual warp coil assembly, not shown. And in this case, one of the warp coils is used for negating the craft's effective mass, whilst the other coil is used for generating a counter force to protect the crew from extremes of acceleration. Of course, within a discoid, or saucer shape if you prefer, the coil would be mounted horizontally. The same applies to the triangular craft on your screen now.
For long duration space travel, you would want to mount the torus vertically in conjunction with other toruses, each one working in tandem with the other, allowing you to take advantage of thrust gravity as necessary. Coils can range in size from mere centimeters to several kilometers in diameter. As you can see, the Warp Taurus assembly is a relatively simple device and with the correct knowledge and equipment, also relatively easy to construct. Whilst the warp drive may still require a lot of energy, 18 billion megawatt hours for a single warp event, with much less power, it's also capable of performing other tasks, such as reducing the craft's effective mass. Although we may not be able to warp through space just yet, we can, however, increase the effectiveness of our reaction engines. You see, reducing a craft's effective mass is akin to having a V8 engine on a skateboard or a full-size jet engine on an RC airplane, but without the mass of such large engines. Given the tiny mass of the RC plane, a full-size yet massless engine would allow the craft to perform fantastical high-speed maneuvers. In fact, we could mount one of these coils into any number of flying vehicles, saucer, triangle, or otherwise, and fly it around. You would not know if we were ETs or from Earth simply because of how the craft would fly. Well, that's something to think about, isn't it? It's time to say, we'll see you again. We want to thank our awesome patrons, especially Walter Matera and Shelby Zimmer for being super light and translight interstellar patrons. And of course, we want to thank you, our viewers, for being here. Guess what I'm going to say? Until next time, keep wondering about space.